Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Brendan Dell. Brendan, how are we doing? Doing well. Thanks you know, for having me. How are you? Uh, it's, I'm great. We were talking right before this, and we realized that we're relatively close. Brendan, where are you calling in from? Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon, folks. Yeah. So we're not too far away at all. So give us a little background. Brendan, where, you know, before we kind of get into your business, uh, Billion Dollar Tech, sure. you, you, you run the podcast. You've also written a book. Um, before we get into all that, though, who is Brendan? Just a little background. Wow. That's a, that's a very that's a sort of existential question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, who am I? Well, uh, I run a company called Go to Market Accelerator. It's an early stage accelerator for uh, B2B founders. Uh, I started my career in actually real estate, uh, in commercial real estate down in LA. Spent the first few years of my career walking up and down office buildings, uh, getting thrown out of office buildings, at which time I was <laughs> trying to drum up business for this team I was working on, at which time I had one of those, there's got to be a better way, epiphanies. And I was like, man, this can't possibly be the best way to go about getting clients. I'm literally walking into random people's offices and asking them if they want space. This is, but this is how they did it, you know? And Anyhow, this sort of search for a better way led me to a book on copywriting. This book on copywriting writing led me down a rabbit hole of copywriting, positioning, marketing, this whole thing. And um, sort of as I was running out of money, I put these two promotions together. Um, they were both direct mail promotions. Anyway, it ended up getting like $50 million in business for this team of which I made very, very little money, but it was a very big success. And it also got me an introduction with the CEO of one of those companies who was like, oh, this was cool what you did. Could you do something like this for me? That ended up being an early stage tech company that later went public. And I par and I've since uh, I pivoted into tech um, where I was more passionate. And that's, you know, fast forward 15 years and, and here we are. <laughs> here we are, here we are. So <laughs> let's let's talk about the first business. Right. You're, you're, what it, what was your first business? My first bit. I mean, I guess kind of that, you know, working in real estate was my first business because that was, you know, you're an independent contractor, yep. um, you know, and that, that was sort of its own thing. And I, you know, I, I did have some very moderate success outside of that, you know, but very difficult time. But I'll tell you what that first business taught me more than anything was I was not a salesperson. Like that is not like, like a born quality of mine. And it was incredibly uncomfortable for me to go up and down those office buildings and knock on doors and talk to receptionists and also just sort of have that imposter syndrome feeling of like, I mean, actually at that time, it really wasn't imposter syndrome. It was like legitimate imposter. Like <laughs> I, I really didn't know what I was talking about. And you're trying to get these like very successful, you know, they have offices on the West side of LA. Like these are like wealthy people, you know, like to, to use me to make their, you know, multi-million dollar transactions. And, but what it did was it taught me how to talk to people. It taught me how to, to sell. And those are skills that have really carried me through. And I think for anyone, if you, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly who listens to your show, but if young people listen to their, to, to your show, man, go out and do direct sales for six months, a year, even if you never want to sell anything, it's just going to prep you for everything you have to do in life. Yeah, I I completely agree. You know, I, I did real estate for some time and that that kind of get in front of people like this is some of the biggest purchases they're going to make in their life and they're kind of trusting with you. So you're going to you're really trying to have to learn the nuances, but you're also having to learn the emotions of individuals, um, how they purchase, why they purchase, uh, what what kind of is is what is what is they what do they find valuable? Right. And okay. finding that's that's kind of like the core of entrepreneurship right there is really trying to figure out what it is that your consumers find valuable and then give it to them, right? Create, <laughs> create something and then monetize it. <laughs> yep. hundred percent. That's basically it. So now, simple, now but, why did, simple, but not easy. Simple, but not easy. Now yeah. you mentioned, you know, you, you went to real estate and then you transitioned into tech. Let's talk about that transition. How did that occur? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really started sort of accidentally and incrementally. Um, it started, it, it, so I, I was never really big on, on real estate. I sort of got into that because it was recommended to me as a good industry and so, so forth. Um, and I got into tech because I had had that, that one sort of 
it was a big success for so, <laughs> big big success for someone, not for me. They made you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars off those deals. But um, the it, it introduced me to this this guy, and I found him. I, I I don't ever mention his name on podcast. Just sitting there asking if it's you know whatever kosher. But the um, you know he was an incredibly bright guy who's building this business. It got me exposed to what I saw was like, you know, the, the, everything is technology, right? You know, the it's anyway, so it got me exposed to this guy and it got me exposed to this industry. And so I, I learned from him and I started, he started introducing me to people and I started walking that story around and it really just started his copywriting. It started as me saying, Hey, I have this skill that I can offer you and I can offer your marketing team, or I can offer, you know, you as the founder. Um, and and that's how that and I mean it was really just freelancing at the beginning is what is what it was. And so was this this kind of venture grassroots effort from financing perspective as well, or did you actually go with some financing to go get books no. and things of like that nature? No, no, no. I bootstrapped everything. I've done a lot of the companies I work with now. Um, they they do raise money. We can talk all about that if that's useful or interesting to your audience. I think. Um raising money whether you're talking about you know raising investment dollars or you're talking about incurring debt there are, you know there, there are reasons to do it um in my perspective there's there's few reasons to do it. <laughs> it generally you don't want to do it if you can at all avoid it um and that goes for debt or equity um capital it just and again we we can talk about that if it's interesting to you but yeah the uh, i i've always tried to avoid that because it creates a host of sort of um dependencies um and and it you know it just changes the dynamic of of how you operate yeah you no know, i think the the general premise of you know this show is to really try to provide just a general um overview of what entrepreneurship is you know and some of the mm. pitfalls so let's talk about some of those things sure. to be cautious of in the in the in the funding world so I think a lot, of, we'll start with raising investment dollars because I think that's what a lot of people, you know, debt, debt is, is, is common. If you have to start a capital intensive business, it may not, it, you may have no other choice. If you like, you want to make chips and you got to buy a chip machine or something. I don't, I don't know, you know, but um, the, a lot of people are sort of enamored by the whole raising money thing. And I, I guess the first thing to understand is like when you, when you raise money, you're changing the entire trajectory of your business because when you when you are taking money from investors, if you can get it, those people are incentivized in a very specific way. And if you move back ten years and you look at why does venture cap or you know further than that, why does venture capital exist? You're saying you're trying to create big world changing technologies that really need escape velocity in order to capture a category, right? We want to take this market. We want to be Uber. We need to beat everyone there because there's going to be some sort of monopolistic dynamic in that environment. And so a lot of people pursue money, but what they actually have in terms of an idea is one, it's not a winner take all market. And two, they change the dynamics of their business from, hey, I can see what's going on here. I could build this organically. I can do what's right by my customers to, I have investors now who are primarily in the raising money game, right? Like the way venture capital firms work that I think a lot of people don't realize is they make money in, in a couple of ways. The first is in a 2% fee that they charge all of their investors to manage their money. So they are actually incentivized to raise more money more often because they take more fees. So they are actually in the LP game, not the founder game. <laughs> and so that is the, and you are just one of many of those things. And they are very accountable to their investors on short-term markups, meaning if I gave you a million dollars and gave you a $5 million valuation of your company, can we now go out and say the company's worth, you know, $20 million on the next round? Cause look, I'm winning. Give me more money. Keep money in my fund. I keep charging fees. And the second way they make money is by the outcome, but those come few and far between on seven to 10 year windows. And so you really just want to keep your fund in operating, <laughs> operating. So this is a very long winded way of saying it very much changes the trajectory of the business. And so the only real reason in my mind to take capital is if you really are looking at the dynamic of your market and you're saying, hey, I think that this is going to be a winner take all kind of a thing and I need to get there first faster and it's going to require a ton of cash or you have enough existing traction that you can look at the business and say, okay, 
this thing is going to give me some escape for a lot. Like I can get there on my own, but it's going to take 10 X longer. And I'm willing to give up now. I have product market fit. I have customer. I have all these things. I'm willing to give up some of that control, some of that upside because I can do it in three years instead of 10 now. Uh, but that's really it. I wouldn't use it to fund ideas. I wouldn't use it to, to uh, you know, cover up problems in your business, which is also common. Like, Hey, I can't get it. I can't get repeatable customer acquisition. So, uh, you know, let's raise some money because it's going to buy us time. Uh, those are all bad reasons in my opinion. No. And this is, this is great. In fact, you mentioned you now have a business accelerator where mm -hmm. you help business to business kind of companies. So yeah. can we want, let's talk about that because I think this is exactly probably some of the information you probably provide one. Sure. How do you start that program and really who, who is it that you're helping? So I work with early stage software founders, primarily in the B2B space. And that's usually somewhere between a friends and like, if they're raising money, it's between friends and family and the series A, if they're not, they're usually in uh, under 50 employees. They're trying to figure out how to scale. And if you look at this market, you are sort of, as a founder, you have a couple of like what, what's, I guess what's common is. You have somebody who's either technical, right? They know how to build the thing or they come from some space. They're like, I was just talking to a guy the other day. He's like, I came out of lawn care. So I started the Uber for lawn care, <laughs> right? Like, or I have a client right now who came out of finance. So she built a tool for finance people. This is super common. So they understand the people they're trying to address. They do not know how to bring the thing to market. And they're left with basically two choices. One is I can take a long time and try to experiment and figure it out. Or two, I can try a hire. And both can work and both have problems. Uh, experimentation obviously is takes forever. <laughs> and it's exactly that. It's experimenting. And there's actually like, you can just skip that step by figuring out what other people uh, are doing. And two, when you are uh, hiring, going from zero to one is a very different skill set than going from like, you know, 10 million to 50 million or 50 million to 100 million, those are management roles. And so when you hire a CMO who comes out of those spaces, they may not even really understand the tactics of which they're executing. They understand how to staff and organize a department. And if you're a founder and you don't understand even like the questions to ask or what the pieces of the puzzle are, you end up hiring the wrong people. And I see this again and again, that people will burn six, 12 months because somebody sort of talked the game well but they actually don't have any idea what they're talking about or how to do it. And so we're solving for those two problems to give founders a place where they can capitalize on what's working right now. They get the information that's aggregated across all the companies we advise and we help them work through all the foundations of what makes a go-to-market strategy, which is ideal customer profile, positioning, messaging, tactics, and scale and leadership hiring. You know, you also, you're, you're really also talking about a lot of the granular things that I think people overlook, right? The customer acquisitions and really like the targeted, the targeted messaging from a marketing perspective. What yep. would you say is one of the most difficult things of being an entrepreneur? Like what, what, or one thing maybe that they overlook the most? Well, okay. I'll, I'll sort of two different questions there, but the, the, I think the most difficult thing of being an entrepreneur is managing the uncertainty. Um, and because you're constantly dealing in, in, in uncertain environments. And so like on a personal level, I think that's one of the most difficult, difficult parts. And one of the ways that you can overcome, one of the things that people overlook and typically uh, don't do well, especially in tech is you can solve a lot of that uncertainty with focus. Um, because the the clearer you are, and when I'm talking ideal customer persona, I'm talking about getting granular about who is this person in a B2B context, what are their jobs to be done? I'm not talking about a title, right? Because a title can mean a lot of different things. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about like, what is the job that this person is trying to do and how are you uniquely qualified to help them accomplish it? Um, and that all helps to overcome a lot of that insecurity because the closer you can get to your customers, the easier it is for you to position in their mind um, as the best option the more you can understand them, the more you can design solutions that are specifically tailored. This first way to kill efficiency in, in a go-to-market strategy is to go broad. It's the first way. <laughs> I, you know, it's kind of funny you say that. I completely agree. I think when you go too broad, it's like focus, what is your core competency, right? Focus on totally. your core competency. 
Now, what would you say has, what is, what are some of the easy things that an entrepreneur has to go through? Is there anything the easy you- things? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'll, the easy, I don't know if it's easy, but, and, and it has its own problems, but if, if you, you know, if you're, if you're smart and you position well and, and you grow, you hit periods where you're like, holy shit, this is, t- excuse me, maybe, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Where you're like, you know, man, this, this is happening almost too easily. <laughs> like, this is just like, it's all clicking. It's rolling the right way. Um, you know, you sort of, you, you can't seem to miss and you get periods like that too. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what you you work for, but knowing that it, it's always a moving target, that that gentleman who founded the company's called Green Pal the other day, he said to me on my podcast, Billion Dollar Tech, um, if you are not reinventing yourself every th- three years, you're not becoming a new and better version of yourself as an entrepreneur, you're doing it wrong because the challenges keep changing. And so if you're not evolving with the, the, the pace of that, um, you know, you're not going to make it. I agree. I, I completely. Agree. Now, what, what, what would you say? <laughs> what would you say? What does it take to be a successful business owner? Like what, what does it take? What does it take? Well, consistency, I think more than anything, and then best as you can, um, obs- I, don't, I don't like to word the, use the obs- word obsession, but the, you know, the, there, there's so many superlatives in like the modern business context of like, you know, you got to kill yourself to make it work and all those things. And, you know, I, you do need focus, you, you do need those things, but it's, it's the consistency and the um, falling in love with the process of it. Because it's easy to get hooked on the result. Somebody one time compared it to me um, to marathoning, which I, I'm a runner. And if you're, if there are any runners out there, you know that basically like distance running is 99% training, 1% racing. Like you, you just it takes you know five months to do a marathon build, and then you get a couple of hours to execute, and it works or it doesn't. And I think business is a lot like that because you're building, building, building towards towards these big points. And you might get your exit or you might get, you know, that have that huge year, but it's that, and it's the process of doing it. So if you're only in it to get that hit of the thing at the end, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to sustain. And so like, what's the day-to-day process, the boring work that's going to get you to the outcome. Now, for those individuals that are, are listening, they have an idea. How do they take their idea and turn it into a business? That's a big question. So the first thing I would do is start with, okay, somebody, there's a gentleman named Tony Jimu who's on my podcast. He's the founder of Oyster HR. This is a unicorn. And I, I, I always use this quote because I think it's so good. There's too many entrepreneurs out there with solutions looking for problems. So they think that they've got this very interesting idea, This, you know, but does anyone care? And so the first question to ask yourself is, you've got this idea, who is it for? And then make sure that they that you understand the problem it solves for them, because there's too many solutions looking for problem. Don't just believe that because it's a problem for you, it's a problem for other people. And don't just believe because you know your mom said it's a good idea or your friend who's in the space. Like this guy Hirsch, uh, he founded a company called All Stacks, which is um, very you know well they're they're growing fast. I think they raised their A recently. Um, and it doesn't matter what they do, but he spoke to 300 uh, engineering um, leaders before he was like, okay, I think this is a real thing. Do that. Like go out and talk to everybody that you think that this is a problem for and vet that it's a real problem. And by the way, if it's a real problem, some of them should probably be willing to give you money in the form of being like an early customer or at least a beta tester to help solve that problem. Because if they don't care enough to give you their time, they sure as hell aren't going to care enough to give you their money. That's very sure. Now you've, you've kind of talking, uh, you know, in, in a way, very confidently, have you ever had a moment of self doubt? <laughs> yeah. Every night before I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> How do you overcome uh, it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I get back to work. That's really all it is. You know, you stay focused on who who the who it's for, how you're helping, and I get back to work. 
And what is it that keeps you up at night as an owner? What or as a you know a founder? Um, yeah, I think as I go on, what what it used to be is just a lot about the uncertainty. You know, will this work? What are people going to think uh, about it? Or what will people around me think? Those kinds of questions. But when you, the longer you go, the more you realize you can only control what you can control. And so if you have an uncertainty in your mind, first of all, is it is it a real thing or are you catastrophizing? And then second of all, go go through the risk. Like, so if the risk is that people don't find the thing valuable, go ask the question, build a landing page, set up an ad, right? Like how can you de-risk the situation to feel, but you know, so that, so that you have less, uh, less to worry about. And um, so I just try to stay focused on those things at this point, because it's, as you go along, it's always something, you know, and it never, you know, you have periods where it's not something, but in general, it's always something. Yep. It's always something. Now you mentioned your podcast. Uh, I've also mentioned the book, give the, give the folks at home that are listening right now, tell them about your podcast. What does it do? Tell them about the book, you know, plug yourself here. Plug myself. So the podcast is called Billion Dollar Tech. Uh, we speak with uh, unicorn founders as well as people on their way there. And what we're trying to do is deconstruct the, you know, the practices that have helped them be successful with their businesses um, and any of the lessons learned along the way. Uh, and the book is called 12 Mutable Laws of High Impact Messaging. I wrote that because I believe um, the way you communicate the value of your business is one of those critical levers that influences, you know, how much traction you can get in at what speed. And it's something that many people overlook and do not um, do effectively. And so from working with all these companies, I documented what I found works and, and put it in that book. Um, and in the early stage accelerator is go to market accelerator. And that's at brendendell.com. Nice, nice. And I, folks, I was looking at the book. It's pretty unique because I, I completely agree with you. It's it's about telling the right story and to the right audience, right? Uh, there's there's various stories you can tell, but understanding who you're presenting to and what story is going to resonate with them is uh, imperable, uh, 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 very important. So awesome. And Brandon, so do you, what about social media? Do you have any locations? You mentioned you have the website. Uh, where, where Where else can folks find you? Yeah, they can. Uh, so they can find me on LinkedIn, Brendan Dell. They can find me on Instagram, the Brendan Dell. Um, and I even think the TikTok uh, that the podcast producers are getting us on TikTok soon. So you may be able to, I'm not exactly sure about all that, but I think it will be uh, under my name or something. On there you TikTok go. I just, soon. I just <laughs> got on the shades of E. So yeah, go. So folks, we are in fact on at the shades of E on TikTok. Folks, so go ahead and follow us. <laughs> I got like three or four videos on there. Brendan, nice. thank you again so much for being on the show. Is there anything else that you would like to, uh, any advice you would like to give uh, our entrepreneurs that are listening? Yeah, if you want to do something, I just encourage people to get out there and do it. And that, you know, you, you know, you can't get the upside without going through the the crappy parts. So anybody's story you see that seems like, and also you, you know, it's easy to listen to the business press or whatever. And somebody's like, they built this from that in, you know, in no time. The real world, it happens sometimes, but the real world, it doesn't look like that. So get out there, go through the, you know, the, 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 the the shitty part, spend a couple of years so you don't have to work for people and deal with their crap for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Brandon, again, thank you so very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. For those folks listening, please follow me at The Shades of E on the social media sites. You can also visit theshadesofe.com to subscribe to the newsletter. We'll have Brendan's information on there the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week after as well. We'll have a dedicated podcast page on the uh, shadesofe.com website. So make sure to visit that after the show and you can get the full transcription of our conversation. Brendan, again, thank you so much. I hope it's not too uh, snow. I'm not sure. What is it out there on Bend? We've got some snow out there? Yeah, we have yeah. had quite a bit of snow so far already this year. So, yeah. We're, we're All right, man. Well, enjoy and enjoy here. the holiday season. Thanks. Thank you, folks, for listening and have a great night.